and just to the introduction, I'm actually going to speak more about Franklin Roosevelt with Vietnam in the wake of the Roosevelt deception. And then in q and I'd happily go to uh, Vietnam and less happily go to probably what you're more interested in, which is the last couple of wars. Um, but I, and I'll have some very, very qualified remarks to say on that. Post. Can you hear me? We're all, all set? All right. I have set myself, uh, but first of all, I should say uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have I've spoken at CGS several times in the past. I always consider it uh, both, uh, and I mean this sincerely, both a delight and an honor to speak at CGS. Um, I hope some of you uh, will consider my courses uh, down the road, uh, if I'm not, you're not too put off by today's uh, presentation. Um, and. Um, I say this because, and I have told CGS faculty this in the past, I find CGS students who take my courses are, generally speaking, better prepared and better students than my CAS students who come in and have a smorgasbord collection and go, say what, uh, at the age of 18 and take different kinds of things. You guys have more direction. You have more focus. Uh, you are uh, well trained. Uh, you have excellent faculty. Um, and I'm not getting paid to say that. So. I have set myself a difficult task this afternoon. I intend to defend lying by a democratic leader to his own people. This proposition is unpleasant, and that is why I have stated it so boldly. To do anything less than be frank would be to dissemble, and that would defeat the purpose of this exercise. Now, most of us, I assume, feel a certain political and perhaps even a natural, taught by our mothers, um, squeamishness at any suggestion that lying by a president is defensible, especially by a democratic president, small d. Beyond that shared disquiet, which I'm just going to assume that we all have, unless there are true Machiavellians lurking at the back of the room, I suspect that this proposal that I shall make this afternoon is more difficult for Americans specifically to accept than it is for some other more cynical or perhaps just more Tory peoples. This is so not just because of a rooted democratic political culture in this country, but due to the reinforcing experiences or the perceived reinforcing experiences of both the Vietnam War and Watergate, in which presidential line played central roles. Those events, I suggest, left a generation and a generation that is now in charge of, God help us, just about everything. Right? popular culture, media, academia, uh, Hollywood, and so on, that generation has been seared with cynicism. Cynicism by the revelation, supposed revelation, that their presidents on occasion lie to them. Other generations of Americans, under circumstances more difficult, have been a lot more tolerant of deceit, especially in wartime. Prior to Vietnam, the argument was much more acceptable among the American governing elite, or elites, however you wish to phrase it, that lying to the public by high officials of the government was excusable if you could cite vital national interests. After all, it was assumed, most plain folks, either because of their prejudices or because of a lack of knowledge, could not apprehend the vital stakes of a given diplomatic or military situation. After Vietnam, after Watergate, and the two blend easily on this topic at least, something of a consensus has developed in the public discourse that lying by public officials is a proximate or was a proximate and maybe even a primary reason for immersion in the disastrous Vietnam War and the constitutional crisis of the Watergate scandal, and therefore that lying is in and of itself a threat to the national interest. That thesis has merit, certainly regarding the Vietnam War, and probably more generally as well. And some of you may well think that that thesis has merit about the current wars. And yet what I want to ask is, does it hold true for all cases? And if it doesn't, May we even have greater dangers lying down the path of what might be a moralistic overreaction, an overreaction to the crisis of presidential lying that denies legitimacy to any instance of deliberate deceit. Now, I'm aware of the opposition this notion will engender. 
But let me suggest, nevertheless, that moral absolutism about lying in public, like any moral absolutism, frankly, is only an emotionally gratifying position. But it is never an intellectually satisfying position. To be brutally frank, it represents the worldview of children. The practices of deceit that I'm concerned with here are not the usual stuff of war making. The moral legitimacy of general military wartime deceit, I think, should be little disagreement that this is legitimate. Uh, it, uh, mostly, let me just list some obvious ones. Assuming that your cause is just and the war is necessary, big assumptions I grant, I think we should simply assume the propriety of lying to the enemy is a moral given. You have an obvious need to conceal, to lie, about your own capabilities for reasons of defense. Beyond that, you need to passively deceive the enemy in wartime. That's a component of any military plan that has any chance of success. We have terms, if you like, euphemisms for lying. Camouflage, feint, stratagem, ruse. These are all particular references to overall needs to confuse and deceive the enemy so that you can better kill his troops, wreck his armies, and destroy his resistance. Disinformation and propaganda, commonplace in war, go further. They're more forward, active measures, whatever jargon you wish to use, to deceive the enemy. They also, however, cross a line into active deceit of your own population. It's necessary for propaganda to work. It has to also work at home to some degree. You need to sustain your morale in difficult times. This can often mean lying about the actual circumstances and likely outcome of the war. But I suggest that in these areas, at least, we all ought to abstain from a position of moral absolutism, to say that it's improper ever to lie to your own people, even when the nation is at war. And the reason for this is a standard moral argument or argument of ethical reasoning, which is that in wartime, very often, there are much higher moral goods at stake than the uh, prohibition against deceit, the preservation of life, primarily, of course, on your own side, and more important, more important than the preservation of life in war, is the preservation of your national values and sometimes even of your survival, presumably the reasons for which you entered combat in the first place. That's, I think, fairly straightforward and quite non-controversial. I want to push the argument further. Let me suggest that the special conditions of statecraft in wartime mean that leaders may, in fact, be morally obligated to lie. And I don't just mean operationally, deceive the enemy and so on. Morally obligated to deceive their own population. They, of course, must deceive their population about operational matters like moving the troops, the sailing of ships in World War II, productivity figures, strategic plans, deployments, grand strategy, where you're going to land next, and all of the rest. This type of lying to one's own people simply reinforces the deceptions you're, time, you're trying to foist upon the enemy. Also, misleading information, release of false information, disinformation, to use a Soviet phrase or term. Suppression of leaks, even pretty dramatic suppression of leaks through arrest and confinement to shut people up. Franklin Roosevelt certainly did it. Other normal, Winston Churchill certainly did it. Other normal wartime deceits, these are generally accepted in wartime by the vast majority of citizens as long as they support the war. In World War II, as I'm sure you know, the famous slogan that summed this up on the average level of understanding was loose lips sink ships. Keep information tight, keep it controlled. You don't need to know. The government doesn't want to tell you, and it may even deceive you so that the convoy sails at a different time than you thought, and so forth. That caution against loose lips sinking ships was just as often roughly enforced on the factory floor or on the waterfront by workers, as it was by police, the FBI, or government officials. These all are, if I can use this phrase, if our mothers will all forgive us, mundane lies, minor lies, almost white lies, which was the phrase my mother used to use. Distinction between, do you ever have that your mother say, just white lies and dark, evil, bad lies? No. White lies. It's okay, it's all right. Little white lie. Never hurt anyone. Yeah, it does. Mundane lies in wartime, they don't, frankly, concern me almost at all. I'm just not interested uh, in those kind of sort of standard lies, which are just necessary part of conducting wartime politics 
and strategy. What I'm interested in today is grand lies, great big strategic lies, the lies to which statesmen have taken recourse in the face of public resistance to their policies in order to get their policies through the political system and enact it. My argument is simple. Even between democratic leaders and the peoples that they lead, deceit on occasion is defensible. When the, I mean deceit of the population. When the nation is an in extremists in fundamental danger. In times of great crisis and of danger, such as faced the United States and civilization itself, both before and during World War II, some of you have heard me say in other contexts that frankly I think civilization actually stopped during World War II. And I would make that as a serious argument. The things we did, we did, were hardly civilized. Necessary perhaps, but hardly civilized. Lying to the public in order to get the American public to move to positions on the war from which it otherwise would have fled. This, I will argue, was the most morally co defensible course of action that the President could take and did take. In other words, while others have rejected Franklin Roosevelt's moral duplicity, I will argue that it amounted to a greater and more genuine moral leadership in a wider sense. His pre-war manipulation of public opinion, his lying, was essential to the national defense against a manifest danger, and it was also essential to securing a longer-term enlightened American interest. But I'm not in the business of hagiography, and so I'll consider as well, or rather I won't so much this afternoon, but some of you have read my article on this, so you've seen my consideration of the consequences of his line about the nature of the Soviet Union, which I'll largely skip today, and just talk about the pre-war material. There were many serious costs to Franklin Roosevelt's deceit, not least of which was a false impression of the internal nature of the Soviet Union and the expectation of its cooperativeness uh, following the Great, the, the great uh, Second World War, uh, which turned out not to come to pass. And this is because for Roosevelt, deceiving people, expedient deceit, even of his allies, confidants, and close associates, was a practice that became personal and habitual. Franklin Roosevelt was a habitual liar. I'm not defending all of that, just the grand strategic ones. He relied on personal charm to advance personal goals. Uh, pardon me, political goals. He relied on Tammany Hall techniques, scheming. These are all very well-known tactics. He was a man, and he was a politician, for whom dissembling came rather easily. Franklin Roosevelt never liked to tell disagreeable truths boldly. He liked you to leave the room thinking he was a fine and decent man, and that he agreed with you and you agreed with him. It's a very effective political technique uh, that others have practiced as well. All right. Lies and the Nazi threat, specifically the Nazi threat. Professor Cicela Bach, I don't think she's at Harvard any longer, but she used to be wrote a wide-ranging and widely read treatise on lying in the public realm in which she referred to Roosevelt's statecraft only once because her book was, as so many books of that generation of scholars are, uh, concerned principally with Vietnam, kind of the Himalayas of their global vision, which I think is wrong. I think the great wars of the 20th century are the Himalayas uh, that dominate international affairs, but that's a talk for another day. She only talked about Roosevelt once, and she did so primarily in order to compare Roosevelt to Franklin Roosevelt's conduct of the war, pardon me, to Lyndon Johnson's conduct of the war in Vietnam. But what Professor Bach had to say should be, I think, by contrast, um, an illustration of many of the points I wish to make today. Because she agreed, she agreed in, in the abstract that the idea that a public figure might have to lie in order to get the American public to face the imminent threat from Nazi Germany was at least worth considering, that the threat from Germany in the 30s and 40s was unprecedented. She then asked, and let me quote, would this crisis justify proceeding through deceit, end quote. It's her answer that I will quote at length that is curiously theoretical and emotive and therefore I think um, revealing. Given what we actually know about World War II, it's remarkable to me that someone writing in the 1980s wrote this paragraph, quote, speaking about Roosevelt, to consent to such a deception would be to take a frightening step. 
Do we want to live in a society where public officials can resort to deceit and manipulation whenever they decide that an exceptional crisis has arisen? Would we not, on balance, prefer to run the risk of failing to rise to a crisis, honestly explained to us, from which the government might have saved us through manipulation? Only those deceptive practices, this is her conclusion, which can be openly debated and consented to in advance are justifiable in a democracy." End quote. She concluded, therefore, that the deceptions of Franklin Roosevelt were inexcusable and unjustifiable, that the price paid by the American polity in terms of broken domestic trust was too high. Rather predictably, she added that the secrecy and the deceit of the Vietnam War, of LBJ and of the Nixon administration, quote, grew at least in part because of existing precedents, end quote, by which she meant FDR. There is not a little sophistry in that argument. Leave aside the non sequitur that advanced consent by a democratic republic or public to its own deception is just that, a non sequitur. It is more telling, I think, that Professor Bach removed the debate from the realm of fact to that of emotionally gratifying preferences, a pretty common academic trick. Of course, any adult citizen prefers being consulted to being duped. But that merely sidesteps the question that we need to consider. Is it pardonable for leaders to dupe their citizens anyway if they believe sincerely and accurately that the security values and life of the nation are at stake, as indeed they were after 1938? More important, I think it is ethically glib to rank the threat from Nazi Germany in World War II with later misperceptions of the threat to the American national interest from the minor local communisms of Indochina in the 1960s. And so let me remind people of what is too easily forgotten. The hazard to the United States from Nazi Germany was a first order threat. It was surpassed in the American historical experience as a national danger only by the disaster of the Civil War. Roosevelt didn't simply perceive or assess or decide that Nazi Germany was a fundamental threat to America's interest in security, interest in an open and expansive world order, and therefore in the survival of its liberal values at home as well as abroad. Aggressive, expansionist, fascist Germany under the control of Hitler and the Nazis in fact posed a mortal danger to the United States. It is startling and disturbing to me that Professor Bach asks us to forgo consideration of the real world consequences of World War II, merely to preserve our innocence from public lives. lies. I submit that such arguments about abstract public well-being are completely inadequate as a guide to moral judgment of our public officials and our public affairs. In order to fairly assess Roosevelt's deceits, we must make a corresponding effort to assess the likely consequences of non-deceit, of inaction. In this case of all cases, the consequence of failure to use any and all efforts to resist the Nazi evil would have been truly horrific. There is, and let me just reprise these for you, some reason to believe that had American industrial might not been brought into the war, the Axis powers may have triumphed. You'll get an argument from historians of the Eastern Front on that. But I would think you, you could say that things might have gone differently and you might have seen an Axis triumph, even with the defeat of Barbarossa in December 41. Had events gone marginally differently than they actually did, the result could have been Nazi hegemony, Axis hegemony over Eurasia, the Nazification of Europe on a permanent basis, and of the Middle East, enslavement of Africa, and Axis occupation of India, which was at least discussed at a certain abstract level between the Japanese and the Germans. They were going to split Asia at Afghanistan. It's grandiose delusion, but they at least discussed it. It is not trite to remember what the implications for the United States would be had Roosevelt done nothing, had he continued in isolation and neutrality, which is what the vast majority of Americans still wanted, into 1941. In other words, 
had Americans permitted Germany to win World War II on the terms I just elaborated. And the reason this is important is because the policymakers of the day thought about those terms pretty much as I just elaborated them. Roosevelt thought those were the stakes in the war. It's a nightmarish possibility. And it's essential to understand that it was possible in order to fairly assess the moral probity of Roosevelt's choices. So here goes. Let me tell you what the world might have looked like had Germany won. The utter destruction of European Jewry, we would be talking about the 11 million, not the 6 million, at a minimum. Mass executions of the Roma, the gypsies of Europe, of all homosexuals or most, of mental defectives, and everyone else not to the social or racial taste of the Nazi elite. The re-enslavement of the Slavic populations of Europe, and over a generation or so, the elimination of something on the order of 140 million of them as well enslavement of most Africans in a Nazified new colonial empire, extinction of the liberal idea in Europe, subjugation of dozens of nations which must have led to endemic violent resistance in years and possibly decades to follow, global domination by the fascist alliance and Japan, not just militarily but in terms of trade in international organizations, in the setting of international legal and moral norms. If you like, forgive me slipping into Tolkien-like language here, a dark new order based on spurious race theory and a racial hierarchy of raw exploitation and extermination. We are talking about nothing less than managed herds of human cattle on vast haciendas run by a new Aryan barony. That was the plan. There's been no war aim like it in the history of the world. That would have led to ineluctable pressure on the United States to form a fortress Western Hemisphere, which was the direction Roosevelt began to move, in fact, by early 1940. A security zone based on the Americas, replete with construction of a severe national security state here in the United States, a term we associate with the Cold War, but it was started really in World War II. Vast limitations on civil liberties here in the United States, deteriorating respect for the independence and domestic liberties of all the other states of the Americas, including, I would suspect, military conquest of any resisting small state that refused to do what America said was in America's interest to defend the hemisphere. That would include Canada, and Mexico, Central America, all the states of South America. I, see, I really see no way around that had the Germans won in Europe. Germany would have been left to harvest the fruits of its victory in Western Europe, over the Soviet Union, across the Middle East, and Africa. And Germany would have eventually, later than the United States, but eventually likely have acquired nuclear weapons. The prospect is truly horrifying when you couple it with the fact that German scientists and engineers already enjoyed a significant head start on missile technology. And they were about even in jet technology, if not slightly ahead. And that even in 1933, Hitler laid out plans for an America bomber, with a K, which actually the prototype was actually built. And in 1944, an eight-engined American bomber America bomber came within 155 miles of Boston. The plan was to hit Boston, New York, Philly, Miami, and so on with an intercontinental bomber. At least, and he was planning, of course, a fleet of aircraft carriers. Roosevelt had his people do the math. They looked and they said, if Germany can control the shipbuilding capacity of Europe, of Great Britain if it falls, and of Germany itself and the French industries and so on, all of that, in alliance with the Italians, who had a significant navy, in alliance with the Japanese, who still had a significant navy. In just shipbuilding capacity alone, the Axis powers could outbuild the United States, even if it went all out, at a rate of five to three. Battleships, cruisers, aircraft carriers is what it would have come down to. Submarines, a lot. Nazi Germany could have won the War of Materiel, Material Schlachter, as Germans call it, on terms that amounted to global dominance. I'm not saying the ISIS would have been invaded, 
but a mass massive naval war over both oceans and a shrinking American influence and a fortress hemisphere? I think yes. The world must then have descended into a new Cold War of a wholly different order. In this alternate Cold War, the United States would have been desperately and possibly fatally disadvantaged by not controlling, as it did in the real Cold War, Western Europe and Japan. Furthermore, think of a long Cold War with Nazi Germany lasting decades. It's going to go hot a lot more than the actual Cold War went hot, and it went hot a couple of times costing millions of lives. Think of the United States trying to fight Germany with no United Kingdom sitting off the coast of Europe acting as a thousand mile long aircraft carrier for bombing Germany and a jump off place for invading Africa and Europe and so on. You going to go all the way across the Atlantic with the convoys and troop ships against all of that German shipping? Not likely. Americans would have faced alone an adversary who even had Hitler passed on, as he likely would have, his successors, say had Heydrich lived, for instance, would have been far more adventurous, expansionist, and belligerent than the Soviet Union ever proved to be. An empire in control of greater industrial, resource, technological bases than even the United States could exploit. Those are, to use Professor Bach's word, the truly frightening and pertinent moral facts about this case, not whether or not Americans should have to live with the minor discomfort of the realization that victory came about in part because Franklin Roosevelt lied to them. Let me skip a lot of material and move right to... I guess I should say what some of the lies were for those of you who haven't read my material. Um, yeah. Following the Munich Conference in September 1938, Franklin Roosevelt became much more assertive about American foreign policy toward Germany. Initially, he was hoping to put together a front to deter war by Germany. Subsequently, when war broke out, to defeat Germany, always still without directly involving the United States. He repeatedly used far more executive authority than was traditional or than some people thought was constitutional at the time. This is standard presidential practice. It happens in every wartime situation. Presidents seize powers from, uh, from the Congress, uh, uh, and after the uh, conflict is over, Congress and the Supreme Court usually claw some of it back, and they never get it all back. The major case of that is, of course, Lincoln in the, in the Civil War. That's when the Constitution really changed. Um, and a new birth of freedom dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. He used executive authority whenever he thought he could get away with it to bypass Congress, to, that subverts too strong, but to bypass public opinion and to begin rearmament programs that otherwise he couldn't get the votes for. He did this not just to protect America's territory and coastline, which is what he said he was doing it for. He did this in the hope of producing enough war material and enough sense of strength that it would bolster Britain and France, and therefore they would have more spine in deterring Germany from war in the first place. If war came anyway, Roosevelt hoped to have the democratic nations of Europe do the job of stopping Germany themselves. He did hope that it would stiffen their spines if they thought that the U.S. would, would back them in the event of war. Even, and he suggested this in private to them on several occasions. We will back you, don't worry, we will be there like we were there before, even though he had no intention of actually doing it in 1939 or 1940. In other words, he generated false hopes among his European allies about coming American support. The man who stated flatly that the only thing Americans had to fear is fear itself generated false fears of an imminent German invasion of the Western Hemisphere in order to frighten Americans into supporting rearmament programs they were otherwise deeply reluctant to support. Conscription, naval building, and so on. He repeatedly warned, in public as well as in private, that Germany had plans to invade Latin America, even though he knew, in fact, that the threat of this was virtually non-existent. He did not hesitate to go much further and become much uglier in his public deceits. He cast wide aspersions on the loyalty, or rather on the disloyalty, of entire populations, ethnic groups, Germans, Italians, 
and Japanese, especially those living in the Latin American countries, where they had very large German, Italian, and Japanese populations, and even to a certain extent those living in the United States itself. He hinted suggestively to favored journalists over cigarettes and scotch that he had information that people in these countries were organizing as fifth columnists and would support fascist invasion when it came. Now, in fact, only a very tiny handful were doing that, and he knew it. He undertook a fairly scurrilous deceit in order to shatter what he saw as the complacency of the American people, including the American media, a people still deluded that their wonderful security and their now increasingly prosperous internal affairs were independent of what was happening in Asia or in Europe, had nothing to do with the global balance of power or the threat to that power that the Axis were now posing, threat to that balance. Roosevelt's scare tactics enabled him to gain approval from Congress for a huge increase in military spending, and then another, and another, and another, always portrayed as entirely defensive in nature, always portrayed as directed solely toward the defense of the hemisphere, of the American coasts, and of the hemisphere more generally. The naval program that he was able to get passed in 1938 actually helped spur Japan toward its Pearl Harbor decision by posing a threat to the size of their navy by around the middle of 1941 or 42 was the Japanese estimate. Now, in 41, 40 and 41, Roosevelt began to manipulate American public opinion on a grand scale, and always in the direction of preparing for war with Germany without ever using the dread word. He said in public, American rearmament is purely defensive, but the very scale of American rearmament gave the lie to his statements. He admitted in private, and German intelligence assessed and concurred, that the United States was rearming not just to secure its own defense, but toward the day when it could provide its allies in Europe with overwhelming military superiority over the fascist states. Beginning in the middle of 1938, U.S. production was put on the path toward war. It's not full mobilization yet, but it's the beginning of an inexorable process. This is probably Roosevelt's single greatest contribution to the Western victory, to the Allied victory, uh, Western Allied victory in the Second World War, was to get the United States up and running years before they actually got into the war, so that when it hit the ground, it hit the ground running in 1942. By 1940, the United States is already in a position to begin supplying increasingly the needs of Britain and France. And it's beginning to build up a huge American army and a truly dominant navy. What Roosevelt was doing was creating a long-term threat to Germany. That was necessary. I mean, a, a large military buildup was necessary to create a threat to Germany. But in order to obtain the funds and the support that he needed to do this, he conjured up in public a short-term threat from Germany, which did not exist. Long-term threat existed. Short-term threat didn't. Most Americans, especially congressmen, will not vote on long-term threats. <laughs> short-term threats only. That's what he did. He knew his people. He knew his Congress. He called upon his fabled charm, his considerable guile, his talent for easy deceit. Was he wrong to do it? Could he have achieved the same ends? Could he have rearmed the United States? Could he have strengthened European deterrence, which in fact was, of course, Hitler was undeterrable, we found out. Could he have appealed to the higher reason and better natures of average Americans, as Professor Bach wanted him to do? The record strongly suggests that any statement by Roosevelt of the threat, any accurate statement, direct statement, any statement of appeal to stop Germany by American force would have failed and might, in fact, have cost him the 1940 election. That was certainly his assessment. He could not get reelected if he told them honestly what he thought lay in the future. Had he told the Americans, we need to rearm because we're probably going to have to fight Germany, by the way, again, for the second time in 25 years. The evidence suggests 
that the public would have, in fact, plunged its head deeper into isolationist sands. It wanted to avoid the prospect of carnage that lay ahead. The polls, and Gallup poll was up and running by 1936, the polls on this are, are quite consistent. The American public saw what was going on in Europe as an appalling uh, situation and was delighted and wanted its leaders to do everything to keep them out of it. Roosevelt hoped that Allied resistance to Germany, 39 and 40, would give the United States enough time, give him enough time to turn around domestic opinion, to build up U.S. strength for the coming war that he thought was necessary for the coming rendezvous with destiny. He walked a tightrope between preparedness measures and suspicion the isolationists had that he was, in fact, planning to enter the war on Britain's side. This was said in public about Roosevelt. He said in public, that's not true. He denied it repeatedly. Although, in fact, we know he was determined to do just that if it was necessary. Take the United States into the war. He believed Nazi Germany had to be stopped by force if necessary. In the 1940 presidential campaign, he came up against a surprisingly adept opponent, Wendell Wilkie, such that Roosevelt was forced to make a public campaign pledge, and I quote, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars, end quote. This mollified traditional Democratic voters in Ohio, Germans, in Boston, New York, Irish, and half the cities of the Eastern Coast, Italian-Americans. The promise was wholly expedient, wholly expedient. Roosevelt did indeed intend to keep the U.S. at peace if he could. It's just that during the election campaign, he already had come to the conclusion this was going to be very hard to do. And he was beginning to doubt that keeping the U.S. at peace was the highest interest of the United States, that winning the war and stopping Germany was more important. Plus, and we know this from private comments we made, we have from, he made to a number of people, that in his own rather devious mind and in confidential talks he had with foreign leaders, he made a distinction that he did not make in public to the American people. He would tell the British and the French that, you know, I said they wouldn't, we wouldn't send, I wouldn't send our American boys to fight in foreign wars, but you know, Europe's not really foreign. <laughs> Why isn't it foreign? Because Europe touches so many vital U.S. interests. We can't really think of it as separate from ourselves in any serious way. Didn't say it in public. War in Asia, by the way, didn't interest him at all. The, the literature that suggests that Roosevelt wanted to get into World War II by sort of misleading the Japanese into uh, attacking him is, is, is really preposterous on, 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 on so many levels. It's, it's, it's uh, remarkable that it was ever taken seriously at all. He seriously tried to avoid war with Japan at least until the midsummer of 1941 when then he concluded that if it's going to come it's going to come uh, and began to uh, sanction Japan in ways that actually accelerated the crisis until the Japanese attacked later that year. By the midsummer of 1940, remember what it's like in the middle of the summer of 1940, let's make it June 30th, 1940, right in the middle of the year, France has surrendered. Britain is reeling. The Luftwaffe is over the channel already, although the full battle of Britain will begin in only a few weeks more time, and everyone expects Britain to be invaded and to be defeated, including Roosevelt's ambassador in London, Joseph P. Kennedy, the uh, patron of the, of the Klan. Think also what's going on in 1940. America's last major allies in the war with Germany in 1917 and 1918. What is their situation? Britain, France, and Russia, or the Soviet Union now. Respectively, Britain is barely in the fight, France is defeated, and the Soviet Union is in clear and open cahoots with Hitler. In fact, we now know that Stalin at this time was offering to join the Axis alliance and that it was Hitler who declined the offer. He had other plans. At any point, however, 
between the Munich crisis of September 38th and the 1940 election in November of 1940, had Roosevelt told the American public, if necessary, I will take this country to war and we will fight Germany. We will put troops on ships, we will send them across the Atlantic, and we will fight another war like that carnage we came out of in 1918, which all Americans thought was a foolish error. Almost all Americans thought it was a foolish error, what had happened in 1918. It was consensus on that. If he had said, if Nazism can't be defeated in any other way than by putting American boys in uniform and sending them to die and kill young Germans as well, I will do it. Had he said that, he would not have survived politically. He would not have been reelected in 1940. And although all politicians believe that their reelection is essential for the country's national interest, in this case, I suspect Roosevelt was actually right to believe that, given Wendell Wilkie's radical isolationist uh, views and general incompetence. But then it gets more difficult, because even after he got reelected in 1940, Roosevelt continued to deceive. His crafty solution was to depict again all of the efforts he was taking toward increased engagement with the war in Europe as exactly the opposite. They constitute peaceful intentions and in moving away from war. He spoke in frank confidence about his real plans to only three men, Henry Stimson, Harry Hopkins and Sumner Wells. And all three men agreed and helped him dissemble and deceive. Later in the war, Wendell Wilkie and the Republicans will also come on board, as will a number of Republican senators, and they too will cooperate in deception of the American public about the nature of the Soviet Union in particular, which I document in the, in the article. By the start of 1941, however, it's beginning to work. And I'm almost done. Roosevelt has successfully rearmed the United States. Rearmament has been underway more or less for three years, and by the middle of 41, it's almost all out. National service has been introduced, the draft. The public is coming around to FDR's view of the German threat. His rhetorical and political and moral leadership is also playing out. Ostensibly neutral America is already building a head of steam toward a full wartime economy, and that can have only one purpose, to wage a great war. Public opinion is increasingly hostile toward Germany. It's hardening. It begins to favor policies that take a harder line, both toward the Germans and then more problematically toward the Japanese as well. This reduces, Roosevelt says, the chance of American end. Our strength reduces. Our rearmament reduces the chance we will enter into the war when, in fact, he's doing it because he thinks we're going into the war. He began to display an openly anti-German character, our policy, by the middle of 41. He offers Britain, who is a belligerent, remember neutral rights and staying out of World War I and all of that? Now we're going to give Britain lend-lease. Whatever we can produce and they can pay for, we'll give them. We can't pay for it. We'll give it to you anyway. Lend-lease. Pay us back later. British gold is in Toronto at this time, by the way. They moved it across the Atlantic in case they lost and were invaded. It was being held in Toronto so they could fight on from Canada and Australia and the empire if need be. But they understood Americans, we're going to need to pay you for those, <laughs> for those weapons of war that we're going to need down the road. Churchill called it the most unsorted act in history, Lend-Lease. Roosevelt wanted to get Lend-Lease to the Soviet Union as well, but he had a real Catholic problem an undigestible Catholic opinion that was violently anti-Soviet, uh, anti-communist, and he had to work on that, and he worked on it. He sent an emissary to the Pope to try and get the Pope to back off his anti-communist positions. Uh, again, I've documented that in the article, so I won't go into detail. Then, quite remarkably, and this is just really quite, quite remarkable, Roosevelt traveled up to Placentia Bay, Newfoundland. By the way, Newfoundland was not part of Canada in World War II. It uh, joined Canada after the war, so this was actually a separate dominion of the British Empire, fought separately in both World War I and World War II. But nevertheless, Placentia Bay, Newfoundland, and there he met with Churchill on a warship in the harbor, and they worked out what's called the Atlantic Charter. At its core were Roosevelt's old speeches, the Four Freedoms Address, and other things, and without going into the details of the Atlantic Charter, which is kind of the 14 points of the Second World War. In the sense, it's a declaration of American and now Anglo-American war aims. It's a remarkable document. The United States is officially neutral. He meets with the leader of the principal belligerent of Nazi Germany and signs a declaration of what amounts to joint war aims, which calls for, and I quote, 
the final destruction of the Nazi tyranny, end quote. This is not a document written by a neutral. It is a non-belligerent belligerent. The United States is in a wartime alliance in all but name with the Atlantic Charter. Hitler, by the way, thought that was the case, that he was already essentially at war with the United States. It's one of the reasons he was so eager, one of the reasons he was so eager to declare war on December 11th. U.S. destroyers now begin escorting British, Canadian, and other convoys, neutral shipping, all the way from Halifax, Nova Scotia, to Iceland. And when they encounter German U-boats along the way, they fight them. American destroyers were killing Germans at sea, and Germans were killing Americans at sea five months before the war officially began. Two American destroyers were attacked by U-boats. The Reuben James was one, and I always forget the name of the other one. And I think on the Reuben James, 47 American sailors were killed and so on. Remember what started World War I, ostensibly? A ship in the Atlantic by the name of Lusitania? This is an American warship attacked by a U-boat, broke in half, sunk, 47 dead sailors. Nothing. That's how deep the isolationist mood still was, even now. That's why Roosevelt, what Roosevelt was working against. He got away with it. He has U.S. warships, the U.S. Navy, in an active shooting war against the German Navy in the North Atlantic. And then he says to the American people, I'm trying to keep you out of the war. And he got away with it. After a decade of privation from the Great Depression, the American public is now eager and enthusiastic about the prosperity of this new wartime booming economy. Americans have always liked to be prosper by selling goods to other peoples at war. Think of the quasi-war with France in the 1790s, the War of 1812, in which they wanted to sell to the French and the British at the same time. Uh, think of trying to sell to the Germans and the British at the same time in 1914, and on and on and on. Now, they're a little bit different. They backed off the idea of absolute neutral rights in 1939, 1940, and 41. But they sure do like selling to the British. They like this Lend-Lease program a lot. And eventually, they'll give Lend-Lease to the Soviets as well after Hitler invades that country in June of 1941. Let me conclude, and we can talk and take it to other presidents if you want. Roosevelt faced an unprecedented challenge to American security in 1940. American isolationism was deeper than it had ever been in 1940. The memory of what was considered to have been a mistake of entering a European war 20, a generation earlier was still alive, literally in the form of amputees and veterans all over the country. And all of that goes a long way to explain and to excuse Roosevelt's manipulation and trickery. I'm going to suggest, as I have argued, that the ends of rearming this country and preparing this nation to defeat Hitlerism justified his expedient means. That said, not all of his lies were defensible. There was no good reason to smear whole populations with presidential innuendo about their disloyalty, presumed disloyalty, and others. But if he deceived Americans about the long-term implications of his opposition to Nazism, and he did deceive them, often and deeply, he served the nation well nonetheless. They were extraordinary days. The danger faced called for a special dispensation from normal moral burdens. I sound like a theologian. <laughs> Roosevelt, I believe, should, we should go further, should be commended for shouldering the most onerous of public duties, personal responsibility for morally ambiguous solutions to the problems of wartime statecraft. It's like some of the incredible decisions Churchill made that armchair theorists criticize him for 75 years later. Not that he's beyond criticism, but it's too easy. Roosevelt did not fear moral ambiguity, as some might and some do. Roosevelt did not fear it to the point that he would impale real interests on a narrow sphere of honor. Roosevelt was not a mere professor. Oh, come on, give me that one. <laughs> he did not indulge in questionable practices for their own sake or because he enjoyed power more, as some people do, when it is exercised deviously, as I suspect Nixon did. 
and even Clinton. Roosevelt accepted the paradox that in times of great and genuine emergency, it is the higher calling of the statesman to deceive in order to lead. Like Lincoln before him, the only other president to face a comparable, and in fact, in Lincoln's case, greater threat to the nation, Roosevelt appreciated that it was sometimes necessary to violate the letter of the law in order to save the rule of law. Both men truff, trod roughly on the Constitution. Roosevelt trod far more often than Lincoln also on the truth. Both of them did it in the name of higher goods. Both men, I think, were great moral leaders as well as great politicians and statesmen who did, in fact, by their actions, help preserve the rule of law for better days when it could, in fact, be enjoyed. If Roosevelt had a flaw, a great flaw, that Lincoln did not, and I think he had several more, it was that once this country was fully at war, once the German threat defeat was assured, Roosevelt couldn't quite bring himself to stop lying and engage the truth about the nature of the post-war world and the internal conditions of the Soviet Union and the likely partner in peace it was going to be. And yet, nevertheless, I think, and I'll stop with this, we should judge him as, on the whole, a moral statesman, a man who saw the world with adult eyes, not those of disappointed children who populate the modern university and the chattering classes. Thank you. Hey, let me have it. Tomatoes. Yes, sir. They voted Democratic. They were traditional. They were part of the Democratic coalition from the New Deal. He had to keep them in the coalition. Remember, it's a fairly new coalition. He had to keep them in his, his, his expanding Democratic tent. And uh, one of the issues he feared could cost him certain states, you know, marginally, could cost him certain states, would be um, uh, anti-German uh, anti rhetoric that would uh, alienate a population which was the most, probably most profoundly isolationist population. Uh, remember in World War I, when it was certainly, the United States was much more formally neutral, it was not at all a crime to raise funds for Germany. You had the American Bund, which was an organization which raised funds for Germany. You had this again in the 1930s. And uh, if you want to go on YouTube, you should, uh, you should find, uh, I'm not sure how you find it, but I would Google Madison Square Garden American Nazis. And you'll come up with a 20,000 American Nazis in brown coats with, you know, Pennsylvania and Ohio accents and swastikas on their armbands talking about the dirty Jew, meaning Roosevelt's cabinet and all of the rest of it. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, th there was, uh, that was a minority within the German-American community, but more generally it was a deeply isolationist, as Ohio has always been the, among the central part of the country, has always been in the 20th century the most deeply isolationist, and it's partly to do with ethnicity. The Irish, of course, don't really want to be involved in any war that supports Britain. Um, that's, 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 that's fairly traditional. Uh, and the Italians, you know, were, were, absolutely didn't want to fight Italy. Uh, by the way, most Italians absolutely didn't want to fight the United States. I mean, one of the most, uh, probably the single stupidest decision of the 20th century was when Mussolini, a few hours after Hitler declared war in the United States, declared war in the United States. And everyone in Italy went, though, what's the matter with him? You know? <laughs> <laughs> they all got relatives over here. They, did, they had no conception of it. And when Americans went to Italy, they were greeted more or less as liberators by most Italians. Um, not all, but by, by the vast, vast majority. Uh, so the, the ethnic, the ethnic it, just as in World War I, ethnic, you can never really assess American politics and foreign policy without incorporating the ethnic component. I don't think you can. It comes up at virtually every issue of human rights, regionalism, um, trade, um, uh, and so on. Prior to World War I, for instance, the major opponents of a U.S. entry into the alliance that won World War I were Irish, German, and Jewish. Why the Jews? Who did they not like in the World War I alliance? Tsarist Russia profoundly anti-Semitic, persecuting state, uh, and so forth. Uh, and there was all kinds of active Jewish opposition to war loans 
to the uh, and successful opposition to war loans to the Tsarist government, and the Tsarist government needed war loans. Uh, so it, it changed. Now, Jews were obviously very much in support of uh, a preparedness uh, and, and anti-German, uh, so, so it had changed. But the Irish were still, mm, and, uh, and the Germans were still, you know, I just want to grow corn and that's it. <laughs> Not go to war. That's glib, but yeah. Yes? Sorry? No. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. The 99% movement? <laughs> I, I watched it for months. All I saw was remarkable, childish naivete. Yes. I don't regret the fact that Adolf Hitler got defeated, and I don't regret the fact that, that Franklin Roosevelt could be able to tell a few little portents did that. But I think that you have to be very careful to, about not being too Machiavellian about this. I agree with you. I think that's why I'm saying, um, and it's kind of a traditional. Nazi Germany is the hard case. It's not the I mean, hard cases don't make good law. I mean, Nazi Germany is the case that is the exception to the general rule with which I would agree that it is inadvisable to permit democratic leaders to lie consistently or, 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 or um, in any serious issues to the, the publics that they lead uh, because this is a threat, as you say, to the very idea of a consensual governing community. Um, but it's an exception. Uh, I think the great difference is uh, in Vietnam, where uh, the Vietnam uh, threat was portrayed as an existential threat to the United States, and I think that's really hard to establish. It was hard for many people to establish, even at the time. It's, it didn't seem an existential threat. Um, there aren't that many existential threats to a major power, especially a dominant power after the Second World War, but Nazi Germany was. The thing is, not everybody saw that at the time. There were large parts of the American population that for various, various reasons um, simply did not see the truly fundamental threat that it was, or basically uh, the, the most standard response was really, well, that's, that's Britain's problem. And even after the United States uh, entered the war, so the Japanese, of course, it's notable that when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and Roosevelt goes down to the joint session of Congress the next day, down to Congress, <laughs> and actually stood at a podium like this. You can see the film also on YouTube where Roosevelt was wearing heavy leg braces and holding himself up against the podium in considerable pain and asked for, a dec for recognition that a state of war exists with the empire of Japan. He does not go on to ask for a declaration of war against Italy or Germany. That comes four days later when Germany, Hitler, declares war on the United States, followed by Mussolini later that afternoon, followed by a series of smaller countries. Uh, a, few, a, few, a few days and a few weeks later. Um, there's a reason he didn't ask for war against Germany. It's because he couldn't have got it through the Congress. Not even then could he have gotten it through the Congress. And the, uh, Hitler, uh, Churchill was the happiest man, probably in the world, but certainly in Europe, uh, on, on the evening that, that Hitler declared war on the United States. Because we actually know what he said. Churchill said, and I quote, now we shall win. So I don't disagree at all. I just think that, um, and really my argument is, 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 is with a sort of overly precious, uh, don't lie to me on any circumstances whatsoever, and I just think you have to say, sorry, in all sort of standard moral statements, it's natural to then give a list of casuistry, right, of the cases that you have to make exceptions to. This is the exceptional case. Another one might arise in the future, but in general, do I want my presidents lying to me? No. Do I expect that they do on a regular basis? Absolutely. Because they delude themselves that the, what is in their interest or political interest is in the national interest. And if they, if they go too far in that direction, we get the tragedy of the line into Vietnam. Yes?
This is a, I think a, uh, I think there's an element of that, yes. I think there's, and, and Roosevelt was in that administration. Uh, I think there, in the Wilson administration. I think there is a larger pattern here, an unfortunate pattern, where the American elites, and I think it's bipartisan, the American governing elite uh, has a pretty low opinion, frankly, of the American public, and a pretty low opinion of the American public's ability to absorb difficult news, especially on foreign policy. United States, let's go to the area of human rights, which is an area that I've worked a lot in. Uh, the, era, the United States always has to frame its major foreign policies in terms of an ethic of liberation and liberalism, regardless of when it's actually acting as a traditional great power. I have a fairly standard view of American diplomatic and history and foreign relations, which is I'm kind of in the, uh, in the, um, in the Norman Gravener realist school, if that name means anything, um, in, in that I see the United States as a traditional great power with traditional great power interests. And that means on occasion it has to do things that traditional great powers do, which is use force to manage its own interests. But it can never say that to its own people. It always has to has to defend its interests in universal claims and justifications. So now it's not the only power that does that, but it does it a lot. Uh, and I think that's the larger pattern. So what Wilson did, Roosevelt did, and so on, it's, it, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's a fundamental distrust that the American people can handle it. And it's just so much easier to lie. And it's done pretty consistently. Uh, at, the, at the presidential level, but not just the presidential level. What's remarkable about the Second World War is how we have Republican leaders and, and congressmen and so on going into the White House and sitting down with Roosevelt and saying, yeah, basically agreeing to deceive the American public on a large scale. Or Wendell Wilkie coming back. We have uh, the American ambassador in Moscow reporting that when, when uh, Wilkie went over and did his, his tour of the Soviet Union and met with Molotov. And he says things like, um, oh, I, I know you have... Our people back home are worried that you have a priest problem. Like they were shooting them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and 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 then and and, and uh, Wilkie says, you know, we understand. We have a clerical problem too. Speaking as a good Protestant American, right? <laughs> okay. What they were talking about was the Soviet Union had shot thousands of Catholic priests in occupied Poland. And the American, I have documents from the administration, the State Department gets together and they agree, and Roosevelt knew about this, and the Republicans knew about this, and they decided to conceal all this from the American people so they could get lend lease through to the Soviet Union. Then they actually said to Stalin, could you please make a declaration that you respect religious liberty in the Soviet Union? Duh, it's easy. You know? <laughs> no problem. Where do I sign? Stalin signed the Atlantic Charter, for God's sake which is dedicated to a new world order. It's, it's the 14 points. It's a new liberal international order after the war based on fundamental human rights and freedoms, including the four freedoms. What do I sign? Give me the tanks. Okay? Um, so I, I do agree. But I also think that Americans need a little dose of Machiavellianism once in a while uh, to, to um, mature their view of how the world really works. But I, I, don't, I don't disagree. Does that make sense? You don't have there was another hand, I thought. Yes? Uh, how about President Obama? Do you see him also lying to the American people, or do you see him as naive with regard to our use of power overseas in Afghanistan? Well, as I said to a uh, BU Today student journalist who wanted to write an article up and interview me for, for this, um, I'm an historian. Uh, I really have, I have no, I have, I have, but no, what I mean by that is I have no special insight. No special knowledge, no secret sources. I know the things you know. We could discuss this as one citizen to another, um, one freshly minted citizen to another, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. But I, I'm loath to stand in front of a public group and say, uh, you know, I think this or I think that. So that's me talking. That's not history talking. At least here I can say with some, it's the documents, I've looked at them, and so on. Um, uh, and I thought, actually, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I was expecting the Bush question more than the, the Obama question. Um, you know, uh, about, uh, how many people were out in the streets? Or I remember being in London with the, say, the signs in front of Westminster. Blair, and in fact, they were camped out for five years in front of Westminster. Blair lied, they died, right? Um, as an historian, I w I'm open to the possibility that Blair and Bush lied. I'm also open to the possibility that they didn't. Because to this day, I've seen no evidence that they lied. I've seen evidence of delusion and mistake and error and so on. What evidence we do have actually suggests that even Saddam Hussein thought he had weapons of mass 
structure, uh, and that he was certainly running a bluff, but not against the United States, against Iran. That comes from the FBI interviews that they had with Saddam Hussein when he was a prisoner for nine months or however long it was. So I, I would not be surprised if when the archives open, there's a document. That, but, but otherwise, I'm loath to stand in a public venue and say that a man of honor like Colin Powell went before the United Nations and lied. I don't have the evidence to say that. That would be a calumny against his reputation. Do I have a smidgen of doubt? I'll entertain it. I don't think so. I also think that accident and stupidity and error explain more things <laughs> in history than conspiracy does. People get things wrong more often than they conspire to, you know, bring about some nefarious, nefarious end. Um, where I, as a citizen now speaking, since you asked me about Obama, have some concerns, and there as a citizen, is this Benghazi situation. Seems to be a, a pretty uh, heavy cover-up. We still, how many months later, do not know where President Obama was on the night that the American ambassador was killed and that our embassy was also being attacked. But just, just tell us where you were. Leon Panetta went to Congress last week and said, well, he wasn't in the Situation Room. He wasn't there. OK, where was the president? I would like to know. Is he just hands off and, like I suspect, professorial? Uh, uh, here's the general direction. Make it happen. Captain Picard, make it so, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, I, that strikes me as his style, but I don't know this. I don't know this. Um, and I can't know it because, I, I, as a professional, at a professional level, I can't know it. So um, do I think that lying goes on on the level that I've talked about, various sort of operational deceits and so on? I simply assume that it does. Um, and then there's also lying, which is much more venal, which is lying to protect my political interest or my reelection or whatever. And that also goes on. And some presidents do it more, more than others. Um, but as to whether they lied to get into a war, either one, uh, I, uh, I don't want to say. Yes, uh, Professor Corn. I think the dust is settled sufficiently for you as a historian to perhaps make some remarks about LBJ. Oh yeah. Vietnam. Oh yeah. Oh, I, th I think. Oh, I think. It, I think. I think. Um, look, I have to say, my views on LBJ have changed significantly over the last 15 years, as more archival and especially taped evidence has come out and been released from the presidential library. Uh, my old view was that I never liked, the, by the way, it's a very, a tradition, it's a very uh, um, standing American tradition to attribute wars to presidents by name. The first one was the War of 1812, which was called Mr. Madison's War. No one called the Civil War Mr. Lincoln's War, at least. But, but, but Mr. Madison's War, or McKinley's War, or Nixon's War, or Johnson's War, or, you know, et cetera. Um, Bush's War was, I think, the most recent. Nobody's really quite stuck that on Obama yet, but we'll, we'll see, because um, he didn't start it. So. Um, but uh, but in, uh, my view was that this is wrong, that this is a narrowing of the causation and the responsibility uh, too, too narrow, that at the end of the day, in Vietnam, it was America's war, that there was broad consensus across both parties, across the governing elite, almost overwhelming, in fact, a consensus like we have never had since on the anti-communist direction of American foreign policy and so on. Um, let me remind you, as a little boy growing up in Canada, in Canada, I had to memorize John F. Kennedy's inaugural address. <laughs> I still remember huge chunks of it. We shall pay any price, bear any burden, to support any friend, oppose any foe, to preserve and protect, and I forget the rest, <laughs> liberty. Right? That, there's never been a more open-ended inaugural, I mean, t forget the Truman Doctrine, look at that, as a path to support any friend, oppose any foe. For what purpose? Liberty, some vague, universalist value. And so I used to think that America's entry into the Vietnam War and Johnson in particular, was basically a grand tragedy, that it was an error, that it was a mistake, as I suspect maybe the Gulf War was, uh, you know, in, in the night, that it was a, it was a mistake and the, the perception of the threat was not what the threat really was. There were exaggerations uh, because of the generational analogies to Munich and the experience of World War II and all of that very familiar stuff. And I, I really did sort of buy into that. 
Uh, and I thought that what Johnson did was come into office, a man who was profoundly insecure, as we all know, surrounded by a people who called themselves the best and the brightest, uh, a man with, what, Northwest Texas at state college education, uh, surrounded by Harvard and Yale and all of, the, you know, all of these, uh, these, these, these true members of the elite and had been elite for generations, uh, and that he came in and he asked, as a president whose predecessor has been assassinated, and he's taken the oath on an aircraft, he says, what do I do about the problem in Vietnam? And the advice from Kennedy's advisors is, stay the course, sir. And he stayed the course. That was my old view. The evidence has changed it. Because the, the documents that have come out and the tape recordings that have come out now show. So I thought that Johnson went into the war thinking, we have to commit, we can't lose the war, and then the escalation is, so you keep escalating because you try not to lose the war, and all of the rest of that. The documents now show. We have Lyndon Johnson's own voice discussing with, I believe it's Russell, the head of the Republicans in the Senate at the time. And we have Johnson in his own voice before the Tonkin Gulf Resolution saying, I'm going to paraphrase here, saying things like, well, I actually, I'll quote this part, I can't see no way we can win this goddamn war. Well, how can you send the troops in? How can you send the troops in? So my conclusion about Johnson has gone from figure of tragedy to possibly the greatest criminal who sat in the Oval Office. Because how more criminal does it get from a president to send troops into a war? Half a million, ultimately that he knew before he even set the first boot on the ground, they couldn't win. That to me was, that was about 10 years ago that that, that tape was released. That was profoundly shocking and it did, it did actually, yes, change my view dramatically. That's why I like being a story. I can actually change my view about it. <laughs>